everyone. We're going to uh, leap straight into the next session. Um, this session is about philanthropy, and I think we should all uh, conceive of philanthropy as a as, as broad a concept as possible, um, including our corporate social investment, community trusts, any form of independent or non-governmental investment um, into the education sector. And it's really, we are looking forward to this panel discussing the role of philanthropy in responding to COVID-19 learning losses. My name is Sarah Rennie and um, I wear a few hats, but I think I am here as the current chair of IPASA, which is the Independent Philanthropy Association of South Africa. And it comprises about 34 or so members um, who are all giving organizations, philanthropic organizations. I'm very uh, happy to welcome our panelists here this afternoon. We have Dr. Fatima Adams um, on my left here from the Xenix Foundation. She is a director of research and evaluation. We also have Sean Bastable, welcome. He is program director at the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation. And we have Pumla Hobe Yabo, and she is head of programs and operations at the Standard Bank Tatua Community Foundation. And we have Kanisa Diamond from the Old Mutual Foundation. She is a senior project manager. So without further ado, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to give us a short presentation and then we'll have discussion after that. Thank you very much. I think it's better Sarah than James. James would have put enormous pressure on me. <laughs> um, so I'm just replacing my CEO, uh, Gail Campbell, who was scheduled to speak at this at this event so um i'm going to start with my ooh, is it going like this yeah so before um before i talk a bit about sort of COVID, i, I want to say that this is our approach to philanthropy and we're not changing it uh during COVID. so the one thing is we build we work on a methodology to create what we think are, is credible evidence about what works and doesn't so we use this idea about what things should be piloted, when we should be testing it at scale, and when we should be dealing with it in terms of systemic uh, relationships, systemic uptake. We still do that. Um, we also think carefully, we have give careful consideration to project or program design so that there's not too many layers and levels in a program so we can establish causality and correlation. We also try to design so that it's, so we say implementable, evaluable, and cost effective, so that we don't end up with this million rand in one school with 20 layers. We don't know what works. We don't know why it works, that kind of a thing. We still do that. We apply external evaluation to all our programs. We're taking that even more seriously than before, because in this time, it's, it's, we, we're sitting in a somewhat unknown space. We think we've got to go back to the drawing board the way to do that is through a rigorous evidence base. And then we try to work co collaboratively to build on existing knowledge so we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We're trying to go to other people, experts like yourselves, to sort of establish what works, what doesn't, what we should be testing, um, and what we know, and then building on, 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 on that already. Okay. Then in terms of... Uh, so, particularly around our COVID response. So, so let me say, I mean, I think we, we, do, we do things the way I say we do, did it, our approach. I think um, our difficulties were, were too slow. So we were slow in responding. Uh, we were trying to be too thoughtful because our approach, as you see from the previous slide, is, is like that. Um, and so we struggle a little bit. We need to like sort of keep that frame and up the tempo a little bit so we can move faster um and and it's something we, we we're learning to do so just in terms of COVID, in a nutshell is we continued some of our long-term work because for us literacy and and working in the space working in education is not a thing that's going to be solved in five years or ten years so for the long haul we kept our strategy on literacy which is a focus on language language benchmark development particularly in african languages african language reader development 
um, in-service and free service teacher development and research. We still keep those because that for me, that's you have to be in it for the long haul. Those are long haul uh, strategic intentions. At the same time, we've been working um, for a long time in schools and we know that there's learning losses and backlogs. It's not the result of COVID. It's been here for 20 years. It's been here for probably longer. So the, the issue is that it's intensified, it's brought it to the fore. We, we have programs where we've been working in this area, not always successfully. We're trying to intensify our efforts in that area so that, be, you know, because it's, it's raised um, the, the, the importance of it, uh, even more so during COVID. And then there was a third area, which is to think about some new developments. And there were just three, three initiatives. One was research and pilots on learning at home, because we were desperately thinking about how you can involve and include uh, the home in, in learning, in, in promoting literacy, but just education generally. And then we did an advocacy and public education campaign around going back to school, vaccine, et cetera, and then supported curriculum recovery initiatives, focusing on leadership and planning and getting routines back into schools. Uh, in partnership with the department. And that's sort of what we've done. Um, in conclusion, I just wanna say that for us, COVID presents an opportunity um, to rethink what we're doing and how we're doing things, uh, particularly around curriculum, differentiation, assessment, perhaps thinking about teaching at the right levels. I heard Ashila say, it doesn't work in systemic uh, uh, sort of arrangements. Maybe we must put it on the table, test it, think about it, but all of those issues, uh, you know, we presented with an opportunity to just think harder about those issues. And I think we must combine our collective efforts to use this moment so that it comes. Thank you. Did I do five minutes? Thank you, Fatima. You had 25 seconds to spare. So I am very impressed with your, with your timing. Um, so what I'm going to start with is, is something very simple, but, but somewhat obvious. But I find... Well, I thought I'd share it anyway, because I find I need to constantly remind myself about this. And it's really about the role of the funder. Um, because if we're going to talk about the role of philanthropy more generally, I think it's helpful to first understand the role of the funder more specifically. And here, what I sort of find is as funders, by definition, we are not implementers, we're enablers. So as funders, by definition, we're not implementers, we are enablers. Sometimes we implement, but generally, um, it's more about enabling. And why that's important is that the question that the implementer needs to ask is, what should I implement? Whereas the question that the enabler needs to ask is, who should I enable? And that's subtly different. Um, it's important as a funder to say, well, what should we do? But it's more important, who knows what we should do? And then let's get behind those people. Um, so with that in mind, if we, if we put that in the context of COVID, um, we took inspiration from a quote by Warren Buffett. I don't know if you know it, but he said, it's only when the tide goes out that we discover who's been swimming naked. Um, and, and we took that a step further and we said this, COVID has taken the tide out and it's confirmed what many already knew or at least suspected, which is that most of South Africa's schools have been swimming naked. Um, and I don't think I need to explain this to you, but maybe I will anyway, because I do remember at the beginning of the pandemic, I read this article where, where someone was posing the question, how should the learners wash their hands for 20 seconds, singing happy birthday, if they have pit the trains and no running water? And then you go, well, that's a good observation, but maybe the more searching question, why do they have pit the trains and no running water if this is the fourth industrial revolution that we're living in. Similarly, curriculum. The curriculum is a beast. How are we to get, to get, get through it with rotational timetabling? Well, wasn't that an issue before? Um, class sizes. How do we do social distancing when we have 70 kids crammed into a space for 35 kids? Okay, but the question, why do we have 30 kids crammed into a space for 35 kids? So, so as we thought about this and we tried to distill it down to something simple, what we came up with was this, we said, our take is more of the same, only much worse. We already had an enormous mountain to climb. That mountain hasn't gone anywhere. And as the academics are sort of screaming from the rooftops, it's now steeper and it's longer. So the way that we've approached it as an organization is really to take that statement in its two parts. So when we say we're dealing with more of the same, 
the mountain hasn't gone anywhere, then sort of like my colleagues here are saying, well, then let's stay the course with what's already in place and working. Obviously, the and working being a key part. Um, and of course, we have to adapt to the new normal, but it's more the point we don't see the need for wholesale changes to the extent that we're dealing with more of the same. If anything, the role of philanthropy there is let's create stability, let's create certainty. The role of the teacher, the school principal, working for an NGO, that's a difficult gig. As funders, we don't need to be making that more difficult than it already is. On the other hand, though, we've got this matter of only much worse. Um, and, and what we've said there is fine, let's double down where we believe we think we can have the maximum impact. And that's going to look different from one organization to the next. But on this side, it's really about being bold. It's about being ambitious. It's about being disruptive. It's about pushing the boundaries of innovation. And I like the word James used, let's accelerate. Uh, there's an opportunity here. In terms of what that looks like for our organization, um, we've prioritized four things. First, teaching at the right level. We need to meet the kids where they're at. We want to go direct to learner where we can. That we think is the quickest route. We want to leverage technology. We work for a global tech entrepreneur, so perhaps no surprises there. But we know that that's not the answer to everything. So the fourth one is, well, let's also be creating alternative pathways. Um, so maybe to conclude, what I can say is this, is COVID has placed this very dark cloud over what was already an extremely dire situation. But, but what the opportunists, the optimists, the idealists, the innovators, and I'm looking at many of them sitting here, what you can see is that this very dark cloud is surrounded by silver linings. And you know, they say that nothing drives change quite like a crisis. Well, as leaders, we're currently spoiled for choice. So I guess my appeal, not only to philanthropists, but to everyone here is let's just Let's not waste this opportunity. It's been an unprecedented crisis, but there's this unprecedented window for change, for systems overhaul. Uh, let's take this window of opportunity. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Gosh, my panel are doing very well on timing. <coughs> Pumla, you're up next. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Sarah, for mm -hmm. this opportunity and to Funda Wande. So uh, from the Standard Bank to, to our Community Foundation, I'll just briefly talk about our general approach to philanthropy and what we think the role is in responding to COVID-19, not necessarily on learning losses, but to the sector at large, which also includes um, the partners that uh, we have partnered with and those that um, we are joining together with in trying to improve the learning outcomes. So the Standard Bank to Tua Community Foundation focuses on the promotion of the economic development as well as education for our young people from their earliest years, which includes the ECD, the schooling, as well as the post-schooling. So over the years, as much as we are such a new kid on the block, we are just five years old, but over the years, we've also refined our investment strategy, um, which has you know, seen uh, beyond just simply supporting the good cause as well as the worthy cause to a type of philanthropy that really digs deeper into getting an in-depth understanding as well as insights of how capital can be effectively deployed to bring about social change. So that's what we have been doing in the past five years. So when COVID hit, um, we were really looking at finding new strategy that would take us to the next level as a foundation that has also been learning um, in the journey. So we have also been striving to create opportunities where we get to test, where we get to take risks, where we also look at demonstrating innovation, as well as sharing knowledge and mitigating the risks through collaborating with others and partnerships. So our approach is mainly twofold. 
We do grant making and we also do impact investing. But in both these roles, uh, we've also used our investment approach uh, for social change as a point of departure. And we have intentionally worked to be more, uh, more than just a transactional funder, but one that is a catalytic funder. So COVID-19, uh, the needs were enormous. Um, we had constrained resources. We looked at how best we could respond to the sectors that we operate in within ECD, within schooling, as well as post-schooling. We also had to look at what the needs were for the partners that had already been getting funding from the, from the foundation. And what we did, we conducted uh, surveys, we engaged the partners, we engaged the sector, we used different platforms just to ascertain the needs as everyone was also hit hard um, by the COVID-19. So we were looking at the best approaches that we could sort of find uh, to contribute to the solutions. We may have also thought deeply about it, but this is what we, we also did. We staggered our approach. We look at short-term, medium, as long as, uh, sorry, as well as long-term um, solutions. And eventually we uh, also opted to fund ECD um, solution uh, that looked at systemic approach and we collaborated with other donors. So what we do expect, um, sorry, can you go back? So what we do expect from the civil society, as well as the existing partners, is really to bring fresh perspectives of what new normal means and how this really affects um, our children on the ground. What do these solutions um, take into account? Are they also putting the children at the center and those who are experiencing the impact of COVID-19? We do believe that it cannot just be business as usual. All sectors were hit hard. We encourage openness. We expect the civil society to also you know, bring greater flexibility as well as look at ways in which um, they could um, look at different approaches. The crisis we also believe that gave implement, uh, implementing partners an opportunity to design interventions and models that will respond to the impact of the pandemic and also find these solutions um, that are really putting pressure in our education system. Implementers also need to engage funders. We encourage open communication. We also encourage um, the different partners to to come with these solutions that would um, enable us to support them. So in terms of the program partners, uh, the milestones and the impact, we do need to recognize that accountability and reporting is an integral part of this partnership and it enables the knowledge sharing as well as drawing of lessons on what really works and what doesn't work. We do need to measure what works and we feel that, um, you know, um, it's important that we, we measure what, what really works and funders need to understand the impact of the program. So if the implementing partners do not really keep track of these milestones in the midst of a crisis, it really makes it very difficult for a funder to know what is it that uh, we need to pick up and what is it that we need to, need to support. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Pumna, that's great. Let's take our last panelists' inputs and then we might have a brief conversation and then we'll open it to the floor. Thanks, Kanisa. Okay, so let me start while the presentation is coming up. 
So I'm going to start by just sharing what our new strategy in education for the next four years is going to be. And we started embarking on researching how we could contribute to education, given what we were seeing as a result of the impact of COVID-19. And prior to that, our focus was very much on the senior secondary phase of education. So we've now um, attending things around. So we're looking at um, contributing to education um, by, by putting our resources towards the improvement of literacy and numeracy. And this is looking at building the foundational blocks earlier using home language. And in our case, when we speak of home languages in the provinces in which we work, we're speaking of African languages. We recognize these languages as assets which already exist in communities. And thus, there should be a way in which they can be used to optimize teaching and learning. So what this actually means is that in the provinces in which we'll be working, we want to explore the use of African languages for teaching and learning beyond grade three. So that the learning journey of learners can continue while their English competency is still not fully developed. And we're going to be doing this through exploring alternative ways of providing content. And so that also learners can have choices beyond just English and Afrikaans. So there are six levers which we will be leveraging and they will be funded at various points of the four years, but I'm not gonna go through each of them um, due to time. But I think if you look at just those six levers alone, the point here that I want to make is that it's quite an ambitious strategy. And it's one that cannot be done without partnering with the Department of Education and all the stakeholders within that system. And also one funder as Old Mutual cannot do it. So we do need to leverage partnerships and be deliver, deliberate about partnering with others so that we can do this as a collective. I just want to share the impact of where we are in terms of CSI funding. And uh, every year, Trilog looks at um, 201 companies in the CSI space that are listed on the JSE in terms of how are they using their net profit architects uh, funding to fund philanthropy. And when they looked at the 2020 in comparison to 2021, there is a 4% decrease in funding. And so what this means is that we're not only seeing budget cuts um, from the uh, public sector, but the private sector as well is struggling. And what is also interesting is that um, when they look at growth at a longer period, um, growth in CSI expenditure has not shown a consistent trend since a period of growth between 1998 and 2013. And that's illustrated there in that paragraph. And here, what we're seeing is that uh, the percentage of CSI funding that has gone into education in 2021 has actually dropped to 39%. In 2020, this was sitting at 50%. And in 2019, it was sitting at 50% as well. So there is definitely a drop in funding. And I think um, budget allocations are decreasing. Um, and therefore, we have much less to work with. And yet, the problems, societal problems are compounding. So I do think that we do need to look at different ways of working. And I'm going to be cheeky and say 
I don't think at this stage we need more innovations. I think we, we, we have too many of them to a point of paralysis, actually. I do think that what we need to do is to actually just take stock of what has already been innovated, what works and has not been scaled. And rather we focus on scaling what we've been doing over the years and we have evidence that it does make a difference. And I think we do need to re-examine some of the ways in which we work together or lack thereof. And I want to do this by reflecting on a presentation that was done by Dr. Crouch at uh, last week in the DBE La Costa, which I think resonated with me specifically. And his session reminded me that we often forget that the education sector, the education itself is actually a system. And I think for South Africa specifically, it's not just any system, it's quite a complex one because of our history. And so we do need to recognize this as our reality. And I think once we do that, therefore the way in which we work has to be synonymous with that reality when we develop our strategies. We need to develop strategies that are appropriate for a complex system. So in his session, he demonstrated what a system is not, and he was using a successful ECD framework followed by Peru as an example. And he says that a system is not a collection of units in a bureaucracy or a list of things. And he says that even if they are well prioritized and they are coherent, in how they are delivered. So if those things are useless in helping you understand whether the system works well or not, and why it does not work if things are not working, then they are useless and that you should not be spending your time in them. So our sector, I think, is mostly structured, particularly the philanthropy space like this. We're doing a lot of things that are not necessarily connected together. We are not well coordinated. Um, and I think we do need to change this. And he says that for a system to work well, we can learn from a few organisms, such as, for example, the Stalins. And we apply rules. And some of the lessons that he, sh he shared, he says that we need to have rules which guide interactions. A common purpose alone is not going to be enough. He says that different connections must be reflective and they must have accountability, must be effective and there must be accountability. And most importantly, feedback loops must be a key part of the interactions if the system is to improve over time. So for me, what, it, what this means is that some of the rules could be, for example, we need to be deliberate about seeking partnerships. We ought to not start any programs in schools unless we have engaged the main custodian of the education system, because as my colleague says, Sean, we are enablers, not implementers. And the custodian of the education system is the Department of Education so that we can ensure the programs fit into the bigger picture. And most importantly, we must monitor and evaluate effect. But perhaps it is also time that we quality assure what gets into school, be it in the form of materials or the kind of training that is provisioned uh, to teachers. Therefore, in closing, as we prepare to rebuild, before we do so, let us reset the rules of engagement. Learners are fatigued. Teachers are fatigued. Everybody is fatigued. We cannot all continue to compete for their attention and their time. It is also time for the Department of Education to put up some guardrails for the philanthropy space. 
so that we don't just do as we please. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Kamisa. Um, oh, no, that's fine. I wondered whether you were leaving. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you to the panel for the great inputs. Um, I've got a couple of questions just to kick us off. Um, uh, things that sparked my uh, mind as we were all talking. And uh, one of the, the ideas that really came through, I think, in all the presentations was the importance of data um, building a clear evidence base of, of what is working. And we've heard about this for a very long time. And I think there's some programs that, that do a very good job of what we would call monitoring and evaluation, I suppose, for want of a better word. But we also know that there is still um, many programs uh, that are implemented, that are supported for a very long time with very little data and very little clear um, independent evaluations. What do you, uh, perhaps Fatima, we can start with you on this question in particular. What can funders do um, to support this approach better and to ensure that both the um, NGOs and MPOs that, that are, are working on particular programs, as well as the funders, um, work to improve that element of, of, of what we're doing? So, I mean, I think there are three parts to or well, there are many parts to an evidence base. So the one is that there must be ongoing research and that as a funder, as an implementer, we all need to go to that body of knowledge um, because we, you know, it's, it's, it's the basis for developing, designing and, go, and going forward. And we need to continue to fund that kind of stuff. So we can't say we support research and then as a funder, we don't want to support, we, uh, you know, we, we want research, we find it interesting and important, but we don't want to fund it. So I think we need to put our money where our mouth is and fund research um, so that, that that body of knowledge builds. Then the second part is to make sure that when we support implementers in the work that they do, that we ensure that some money, again, it's about money, I guess, as, as you were saying, um, about uh, providing a space to make sure that there's a monitoring framework for the implementer so that they can do their work. And in order to make sure that implementers have monitoring practices, monitoring frameworks, you have to provide resources for that work. You can't expect data to be captured and collected and uh, analyzed when there's no resource to, to do it. And, and NGOs are, are, are run off their feet uh, and the implementer and the trainer and the somebody who's also the data collector and the, and the analyst, it becomes very, very difficult to monitor programs carefully uh, and develop a monitoring framework. And then the last one, which is, uh, I guess, I would say externally driven evaluation is very, very important because it creates credibility around programs. Um, and there are two elements of that. It's about carefully designing these evaluations so that they can tell us what a, the program is able to do and whether it, and, if it isn't what the problems are, you know, that kind of thing. Um, usually mixed methods is, is kind of uh, an approach that could be used. I think most importantly from a funder's perspective is that that costs. So I heard somebody say 5% yesterday, but actually it's almost between 10 and 20% of the program costs to actually get a solid externally driven and led evaluation by experts. So I would say that those um, areas together will create a body of evidence that can help us go forward uh, every single time. Yes. Thanks, thanks, Fatima. I mean, I think for me, the two things really come out of that is, um, is one, you've really got to put your money where your mouth is. Uh, we can't keep talking about monitoring and evaluation and not spend money on it. And the other thing is, I think often, uh, both to use your language, Sean, the enablers and the implementers, um, it's a really difficult, sometimes awkward, incredibly painful thing to um, get bad news and uh, to close down something that's not working, especially if you've invested maybe decades 
uh, into that particular approach. And I think perhaps the next time we can have a conversation is, is how do we get a bit braver about abandoning projects that are just clearly not working, the evidence isn't behind them. Um, Sean, I just wanted to go on and ask you a little bit about, um, about the, you know, the approach that you were describing about kind of sticking to that long-term strategy, sticking to the stuff that, that, you, that you have been doing that works, um, as well as being open to, to implementing new ideas and to innovating on, on new ideas. If we consider what the researchers have been saying in previous panels to us, there's some very clear directives or challenges about change, about changes. So we faced with a, a really um, clear situation now of learning losses. How do funders get behind changing long-term strategies to say, this is now clearly on the table. We can't ignore it anymore. We love our programs and we love our strategy. And in fact, the strategy review is only up for three years because we're only into year two of our cycle. But researchers are now giving us a new set of, of results. How does one deal with that as a program director and reconceptualizing and changing course? Um, so fortunately for me, we have an executive director who is big on this and and it's something that i've had to learn so we we have a, a sort of mantra within the organization that says let the work inform the strategy okay so so generally we come from a sort of corporate background where the consulting types the natural tendency is to sit in your office to hide in your boardroom with your whiteboard and to <laughs> hypothesize all these things and to churn out slides and all these great ideas and she says i don't want you to do that get into the field Go and enable the first implementer that like look at a few and pick one don't overthink it just get stuck in and and as you do that it's going to inform your strategy um and and then it becomes this iterative thing so it's not that you don't have a strategy it's just don't sit there in your little tower imagining what the solutions are get stuck in sit alongside the implementers who understand the context and as you learn from them cycle back and adjust and i think if we're always in that cycle then then that can work because the work should tell you it's not working mm. um, if the money is not flowing from other funders or or if the team isn't implementing or you're not seeing the learner outcomes change or whatever it is you're after don't sit on it adjust um, great great thanks sean i mean i think that's often um easier said than done because for me a couple of things that um the effectiveness of that is premised upon is a is a good and open relationship with those people that you're sitting alongside as well as your as well as your data i mean just turning to you kanisa you spoke really um i thought very powerfully about um how we can have better effective collaboration and cooperation um within the sector you know i was initially thinking of of that and i'd love to hear your views on that in terms of the funding community but how can we improve, improve that cooperation and collaboration between civil society and funders or implementers and funders, however you, you know, whatever language, you know, you're comfortable with, so that this virtuous circle of learning, implementing, changing strategy, this wonderful responsiveness that we need, you know, to start solving these problems happens. How do you think those kinds of relationships can be improved? Um it's it's not it's not an easy it's not an easy process and i think um what is important is that at the start of the developing of strategies you as a corporate funder you don't just sit in a corner and you develop your own strategy as you see the world mm -hmm. through the eyes of business what is important is that during that process, make sure that there's a consultation that happens with all the civil society partners, the people on the ground, let teachers inform your strategy, let the NGO sector inform your strategy, let the Department of Education inform your strategy. Mm -hmm. And so once you have a, an idea of what needs to be done and you have people who have contributed to that strategy. The next stage is to then spend time um, forming those partnerships. Don't rush into implementing. Make sure that the partnerships are in place.
case and make sure that everybody is clear and you have a common goal on what needs to happen and you all agree on how you are going to work together before the implementation happens. And if those foundations are not in place, don't start working because often we as the funders, we want to be able to say, we have dispersed our funds and we have used these funds for so many people. And so we rush into implementation. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that we could just look into. Great. Thanks, Kanisa. I mean, I think really what you're talking about, again, is this idea of, of the rules of engagement and, and the roles and responsibilities of the different players in that complex system. Um, and Pumla, you know, as uh, Tatua have always, um, and I hear the challenge from Kianisa around innovating, but, but I think, you know, as, as independent funders, we are um, in, a, in a great space that, you know, unlike the system holders, the DBE, who are very constrained in the way that their funding is spent, that um, as funders, we, we are more flexible in the way that we can spend our, our money. And I think testing ideas, uh, whether we should do work harder to take stock of, of the ideas out there first before we start testing new ones. But my question to you, Pumla, is how does that testing and innovation and trying out of ideas, how do you ensure that it doesn't just stay where it is. There's been a lot of talk about systemic impact. How does one start to try and um, position those, those crucibles of testing into a broader system, whether it's with government or whether it's with other elements within the system? Do you have any ideas around the role of funders in the systemic and government relationships? Thanks, Sarah. I think for me, it also starts with being intentional uh, in your testing, and you need to be very clear from the onset. You are testing for what? Uh, what is the ultimate goal? Does the testing also create an opportunity to be scaled? And if so, can you then um, collaborate with other like-minded donors who have similar kind of ideas, mm -hmm whose strategies are also aligned to the ideas that you are also uh, testing. Because if you test and you don't do anything about it, you don't share the learnings, it means we are just doing business as usual. Uh, we will not get to see the outcomes that we are all wanting to see. So I think it's important from the onset, it's also important that you continuously engage you share the lessons. And when you test, it doesn't necessarily mean that you will get uh, the positive outcomes. Mm -hmm. So I think the advantage as well, uh, being an independent funder, that there are no shareholders. Mm -hmm. So if we lose, you know, whatever that we may have invested, the good thing is that we are drawing lessons uh, from whatever that we have learned. And we are able to share what works, what doesn't work. And that gets to inform the sector on which uh, interventions need to be backed up, which interventions do not work. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pumla. Well, I think there's a lot. Um, I can see arms are waving <laughs> with excitement already in terms of questions. Um, when we had a meeting yesterday to just uh, meet each other and, and have a, a chat about this panel, I was very. Um, bossy with this panel and I told them that they could not set out their wares. I didn't want the long spiel about all the different programs and how fantastic all their different uh, um, organizations are. And I think they did a great job at that. So thank you very much. We just stuck, got right into the issues. I'm gonna ask the same of the floor. Let's just drill straight into the meaty issues. I know there's always an opportunity that sometimes is felt missed with, with funders. And I'm going to ask you to set that aside and just let's focus on the issues and the discussions, the ideas that have been raised. Thanks very much. So I think we've got time uh, for five questions. Five questions. Five minutes. Oh, so five minutes, what's that? Three questions. Okay, one at the back. 
Mm. Hi, um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mamu, so I've just joined uh, WordWorks. Um, thank you to the esteemed panel there. It's a, um, a world I'm familiar with in terms of um, the funding community. So COVID has really um, showed us flame, just to quote a black Twitter, <laughs> in that, I mean, what are the conditions that maybe engender accountability and enable development that the funding community has had to think about their own funding guidelines. I mean, an, exa an example from WordWorks and other organization is we had funding to do maybe face-to-face -face training. However, due to you know, lockdown um, restrictions, we couldn't do that and diverted some of the fund, uh, some of that fund funding into maybe online training and giving data to organizations that really needed to sort of pivot the way they've been doing business. So COVID has given an opportunity for even the funding community to look at their funding um, conditions that really impede development, but still would engender accountability. Obviously, the same can be said of us as implementers. We've had to have a hard look at ourselves and how we do business. Thank you. I'm gonna take this one last question. Thank you, the lady with the colorful top. And um, unfortunately, we're gonna to have to wrap because I think we're running half an hour behind schedule. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Sean, one of the most important things that I think you've said for all of us is the fact that um, funders are enablers. I'm not sure whether you know how powerful that statement is because the power of it is what you enable. And that's the dangerous part. We have a system that has been unable to move despite all the funding pumped into it because it's what has been funded that we are sitting with today. And apartheid, if you look at the 2017 book, the cooperations that funded and profited from it. This is why we continue to sit in these meetings and ask the same question, because of the people who funded those activities. They did a very good job. So it's very important what Ukanisa was saying about what do you fund? Who do you know? And where do you not go? Because you are unable to venture into other things that are new in the system. So it's a very critical question because it has lifelong effects. So whatever you fund will come back to bite us in the system 20 or 50 years later. So thank you very much. That's the most significant part of this whole story about philanthropists and, <laughs> and what they do or what they don't do. So I thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I think with that um, powerful uh, reflection on the panel, um, I wish we could speak a bit longer. Is there anybody, I would like to invite anyone from the panel who would like to respond to the comments or make a wrap up statement before we leave the stage? I think Thanks, um, just on the question um, on, on conditions, I think from a funding perspective, we recognize a need to be agile, to be open and to trust. Mm. But that trust also goes with accountability. And I think it's important for implementing partners, for organizations to also begin to inculcate that with, a, with their own beneficiaries, but also in turn to communicate with the funding body uh, on challenges that they are experiencing on the ground. And without that context, we are unable to support. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for your contribution. Sean, yes, I, yes, absolutely. Hello. Yeah, I just want to say thank you for the comments. I think it's important to understand as funders, we are stewards of the money that we're given and a huge responsibility to be, oh, not to be taken lightly, but maybe the feedback I would give to implementers is stay close, stay close to funders and similarly funders stay close to the implementers so that we understand and we don't make these decisions randomly without the information we need. Great. Thanks, Thanks. so much. Thank you.